Can you hear me? Good. Sir Martin, can you hear I me? I can hear you, Jason. Great. I, as I said, I was a bit, a bit chastened. It's early in the morning here in New York, not <laughs> the sort of thing that you want to wake up to. <laughs> right, excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us. I, I'm Jason Carrion from Quartz. This is obviously is Sir Martin Sorrell from WPP, formerly Wire Plast and Plastic Products, now the world's largest ad agency, uh, $550 billion industry. We are here, Sir Martin, to talk about the state of play in global advertising I, business I and brands. Got, I've just got to correct you, Jason. Okay. A trillion dollar industry. A trillion dollar industry, okay. Right. Not according so, to your forecast so old, that old, I just remember. Old, old, old style advertising, about 500 billion, and about 500 billion in the other, the other stuff that we do, including digital. Right, okay. Speaking of, of the other stuff, I want to ask you about uh, fake news, about uh, yeah. Facebook and Google. Are, I think, yeah. am I right in saying that those are the two largest, um, uh, the two platforms that you spend the most of your clients' money on? Mark Zuckerberg. Well, uh, well, well just, just, uh, just to get it right, uh, this year, uh, Google will be the largest, so they'll, they'll account for about Five billion, uh, five and a half billion out of uh, 75 billion that we uh, we don't spend the money. We we invest right. with with our clients in or on behalf of our clients. That so so Google would be number one. Number two would be uh, what I guess is the only truly global uh, media mogul. That's in Rupert Murdoch's uh, Nexus, which would cover Star and and Sky and Fox and News Corp. And then third would be Facebook, around 1.7 billion. Uh, the Murdoch uh, group would be about two and a quarter billion. Facebook would be about 1.7, having been one billion last year. Google, say five and a half versus four last year. Uh, and the, the other big media owners uh, are quite similar to Facebook at around 1.7 and, and go down to about three quarters of a billion. So that's. It's highly fragmented, as you can see from that. It's out of a total portfolio of about 75 billion. I would expect next year Facebook to be, if not number two, next year, uh, probably by 2019. Right. So speaking of, of Facebook, uh, fake news, hyperpartisan news, these kinds of things. Mark Zuckerberg said recently that it's a right. pretty crazy idea that that swayed people's opinions in the U.S. election and, and, and some of the other votes. Does that mean that advertising on that platform is, is, is also perhaps less effective than we think it is? I know you've gone after them, for example, how they measure video and this kind of thing, but talk to me about uh, your concerns about perhaps your, your clients' messages appearing alongside some of this fake news and the other things that we're seeing well, I, I, on these social platforms. Yeah, well, it, when one learns that the, the, the single biggest fake news story uh, during the election here in the US was the headline, Pope endorses Trump, you get a little bit, a little bit con concerned about, uh, about that. So having said that, the issues around, Jason, around measurement, the issues around fake news, uh, all these issues uh, have raised serious uh, concerns, and I think uh, amongst our client base, and quite rightly so, we've been, you've had Eric uh, Salama on, on, on his or Yossi's so-called panel a few minutes <laughs> ago, and, uh, and Eric is intimately involved, we've, we've invested uh, in Comscore, we own 20% of Comscore, which was an amalgamation of Comscore and Rentrac, precisely because we wanted to improve the standards of measurement across all media. Now, what, what this measurement uh, fracas uh, and fake news fracas have, have brought to, to everybody's attention is that in, in many people's view, and certainly in my view for a number of years, Google, Facebook, indeed Snapchat, Twitter, LinkedIn, AOL, all of them are not technology companies, they're, they're technolo they masquerade as technology companies, they're basically media companies. And right. there is no way, and you know, far be it from me to, I'm in no position to, to uh, go head to head with Mark Zuckerberg or criticize or whatever, and let's put that to one side. 
but there is no way that they can claim to be digital engineers, tightening digital pipes with their digital spanners and not be responsible for the stuff that goes through their pipes. And it's, in my view, outrageous that they, that they would try to disassociate themselves from responsibility for the editorial. You've worked in the media, Jason, you, you've been in the Economist Group, you've been elsewhere, you know that you take responsibility for what you write. So, for example, Indeed. I mean, just give you two, two examples just in the last 24 hours. Willett Kingston Smith puts out their annual survey, their numbers are wrong. <laughs> when their numbers are wrong, we speak to the, the, the journalists and we, we correct them. This morning, a breaking news came out from Thomson's Reuters, their numbers are wrong. We talk, to the, we talk to them and try and get them to correct their numbers in relation to the industry and indeed in, in one case in relation to ourselves. So you have to take responsibility and there is no way that Google and Facebook can disassociate themselves from responsibility. They are media companies. And that's the issue that you've just touched on. And this is very important in, in terms of the balance a perceived balance between, let's call it, old media and new media. Right. The old media, the traditional media, take that responsibility, I think, pretty seriously. The new media discharge your responsibility. They're not going to be able to do that. Right. They're not going to be able to do that. To what extent, then, do ad agencies like WPP and all of its various subsidiaries who you know, f are the, some, of the, some of the main uh, spenders on these platforms, to what extent do you have responsibility for vetting, particularly in like pro programmatic adver advertising, where these brand messages appear next to stories about the Pope's love of Donald Trump, et cetera? Well, if, if, if we misplace ads, and this applies to traditional media as much as it does to news media, right? and the clients have not approved it or it ends up uh, accidentally against editorial. I mean, there have been situations, many situations where agencies have placed advertising next to editorial that, that, has, that has been a problem from their point of view. So we take that responsibility pretty seriously. I mean, the, I, I guess the, the question that you're getting round to <laughs> is you know, whether we, we should think more deeply and more seriously about it, and we do. And in, in, an, in an era of purpose-driven marketing, I mean, I don't think there are many, if any, clients that I can think of that don't take purpose, uh, call it social responsibility, whatever, I think purpose is probably the best description, don't take purpose extremely seriously, uh, and it is front and center in their strategy. Now, talking about it and doing it are two different things, but certainly it's front and center. There's very little greenwashing that goes on today as opposed to 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. We know that purpose is important to consumers. We know that purpose is important to people inside organizations or people who are considering joining organizations or millennials or centennials, however you want to describe it. So this whole area is becoming increasingly important. There's one, one other thing I just want to, want to say in relation to the question. It, there is a view, and, and I heard it last night uh, here in New York, again, put quite forcibly, that new media uh, are, are, are part of the reason for their strength is their fashionability. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I totally agree with that, but, but I would make the point, you know, Facebook has, I think I'm right in saying, issued four corrections. There was, a, there was one time they issued one correction to the denominator on three second views, and then there was, a, I think, three other corrections that they issued a few weeks ago. If a, if a traditional media company did that, they probably would be eviscerated. They, they, have not, they have not suffered, at least in the short term, from what we can see, uh, a similar 
similar punishment. We'll see whether in the longer term, I think what you might see in the new media marketplace is Snapchat certainly is seen by some as a third force. If the AOL, Yahoo, Nexus, Verizon Nexus starts to get some traction, that's a third force. We see our own Zaxis with that Nexus as a third force. The traditional media uh, could form together their own third force. But the duopoly of Google and Facebook is extremely strong. And all the issues you just touched on, fake news, measurement in particular, what, what Keith Weed, as CMO of our second largest client, Unilever, has called uh, the three Vs, value, viewability, and validation. All those issues uh, have been raised by what you raised in your, your first question and subsequent questions, and things that we have to take very seriously, because traditional print, as you well know, <laughs> particularly interestingly, since the beginning of this year, has been under tremendous pressure. We've seen in the UK circulations down 5% in traditional print newspapers, newspaper advertising down 15, 20. Last night, I was told by one major group their advertising is down 25%. Subscriptions are up, interestingly, mm -hmm. but, but ad revenues uh, are down. So these are serious issues, and they're existential issues for those media. Right. Getting back to the point of, of purpose, I wanted to ask you, when you're working with clients, I think, you know, purpose can be these kind of fundamental human rights type things, but it also veers into politics. And I think with right. Brexit, Trump, et cetera, et cetera, you know, one FTSE CEO told me before the Brexit vote that his company's position was that they were passionately neutral about the vote, which, which seemed kind of mealy-mouthed to me. It, it's, it seems hard now, I think, for companies to remain neutral um, on, on these types of things. And we've seen some, some companies just like divest from the Daily Mail, and obviously, as you said, trying to get their brands away from, from fake news and whatnot. I mean, is this, is this something you, how are you consulting with companies about whether or not they should stick their neck out, so to speak, on political matters, on, on, on advertising their, their, their purpose, well, that sort of thing? Well, just, just, just deal with some specifics. I mean, on Brexit, personally, I was, uh, a Remainer, uh, in, when asked uh, by anybody, uh, you know, if you had asked me, I would have said my personal view, and I, I would underline personal view, we have uh, 16, 17,000 people right. uh, in the UK. It wasn't my position to either advise them or tell them which way to vote. I, I think it was our position to say go out and vote. And, and about, what was it, almost two-thirds of the population voted, but there was a, a third that didn't. And when you think the margin was 50 to 48, uh, and that maybe some of the younger people, I remember uh, Chancellor of, or Vice Chancellor of Oxford University saying they had done a similar campaign to get Oxford graduates to come out to vote, but only about 40-odd percent of them actually voted. So, so clearly, I, I think there's a responsibility in those sort of situations to say vote. Uh, I'm not sure that it would be right for a, a CEO of a company to say the company, uh, express the company's view, but they can express their personal view. On this question about advice, I, I think the advice would be don't jump on the bandwagon for the bandwagon's sake. If you can, if you have an issue that affects your business because of where you're located. I'm thinking of the, the transgender bathroom issue in, in North Carolina, mm -hmm. which the Bank of America, for example, took a position on because that's where its headquarters is. That's a community in which they're, they're highly prominent and therefore they felt it was the right thing to do. That's fine and I think that is something that is, but it's very difficult. I mean, for example, if you look at what's happening here in the U.S., uh, Kellogg's have taken a position on Breitbart News. Right. Uh, they've withdrawn uh, their spending from Breitbart. Now, like it or not, Trump uh, got votes from, what, 25% or so of the U.S. population. And, you know, if you take a position on something like that, 
It is one quarter of the US population that uh, has voted for Trump. They're not all Breitbart News people, but everybody has a right to be heard, even if you disagree with what's being said. So I, I think the answer, Jason, is you have to pick your causes and your purpose carefully and make sure that it is very significant and relevant to what your company does and what you're doing. Uh, you know, for example, uh, do I think that free trade, you know, one of the other issues that was on the list of things that you, you possibly want to touch on, do I think free trade is important for WPP? Yes. <laughs> so would I be in favor of free trade agreements, whether they're multilaterals or bilaterals? Yes. Does it matter to WPP if there is protectionism? Well, the answer is it's a bit like the curate, curate's egg, because what we lose on the, the multinational swings, because multinationals are about, let's say, half, 60% of our business, local companies, regional companies, are the balance. So we have a sort of 50-50 split, approximately, between those companies that violently benefit from global free trade and those companies that are, are not necessarily as affected or advantaged by, by protectionism, i.e. the local companies. The other thing, of course, is that if, if the, the analysts are right and what Trump means here in the US is a stronger US economy, which I think it does do, certainly in the short to medium term, right. And in the longer, and in, and in the international sphere outside the U.S., you know there'll be there'll be some issues, some volatility, whether it's Chinese relationships, a, a plus maybe with Russia, uh, Mexico question mark, and other countries. But given all that, um, that you know what you gain on the the U.S. swings, you lose on the international roundabouts. It's quite complex. But, you know, I think in that scenario where we would say we were in favor of free trade, we'd be in agreement with what the president-elect says, you don't enter into agreements that disadvantage you, you enter into agreements that advantage both sides. And if you, you, see, you see trade agreements that disadvantage you, you try and renegotiate, or you, or you say you're not going to be a part of them. So, uh, net net, I think you you pick your your causes and you pick your areas and you focus on them in relation to business. You don't come back to where I started. Don't jump on the bandwagon and and embrace everything for everything's sake. Right. Um, so focusing a bit more uh, back on, on onto maybe some of the, the logistics around advertising, which I think some people here wanted to hear about. Um, social media ad spending is set to overtake newspapers by the end of this decade, according to some forecasts. Do people want to be friends with brands? Yes, I, 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 think, I think basically they do. I mean, we're, we're really? trying to develop uh, a relationship, uh, and I think the answer is very simply yes. I mean, it depends what those brands stand for, uh, and de depends on how those brands are perceived and how they change over time. But Yes, I think there's a relationship with brands, and we're in the business of building relationships, those customer relationships with, with corporate brands, with product brands, with service brands, geographically around the world. So I think, yes, basically, people do want to have a relationship, and they take pride uh, in using the products they do and using the services they do, because it says something about themselves and their personalities and their likes and dislikes. Right. Is there is there a, a limit to the amount to the, to the to the extent that social media advertising can grow? That kind of you know micro targeting, that personal relationship you were talking about, d d versus the kind of broad brush, you know, especially on maybe offline um, type platforms like television or, 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 or these types of things. I mean, is social media just going to eat everything eventually, or or is there an inbuilt limit to it. Well, it's not, it's not just social. I mean, the, the use of the word social, so, so let, let's call it more broadly new media. So it's that, 
it's that stuff outside traditional. I mean, mm -hmm. j just back, backtracking a bit, remember that TV around the world, if the, if the traditional media market is about half a trillion, and the, the rest of the stuff we do, whether it be in data, public relations, public affairs, digital, uh, branding and identity, healthcare, and all that stuff is another half, half a trillion. So that's where you get the trillion pro from. In the traditional 500 billion, 40% uh, of that worldwide, maybe a little bit more, 43, 44%, and for the foreseeable future, will be in network linear TV. So the suggestion that, that television might die uh, is, is totally misplaced. And, and the same would apply even to traditional newspapers on a global basis. Mm. But some of the things that we've seen in the last few months, and I, ref I reference what's happened, been happening in the UK, similar things we see here in the US to traditional newspapers, uh, you know, have called into question the, eff the effectiveness of those traditional media. And, and I think what's happening is the pricing the pricing is changing. So let me just give you a specific example. You look at the data here in the US for time spent versus industry investment. The time spent by consumers on newspapers uh, and magazines is 4% of their time. And the industry is still spending, if I remember rightly, about 12% of the budget. So there's a discontinuity that has to change. However, if you look at engagement statistics, Virtually any country in the world, and Eric and his team at Kantar, who measure media in 51 countries around the world, can tell you this. If you look at engagement data, for example, the Times newspaper in London, I think on average somebody will spend <coughs> 40 minutes looking at that newspaper. That's right. got to be more value to our clients than a three-second view on Facebook even if they make it a seven second view, when 50% of the time the sound is turned off. So <laughs> the measurement metrics are absolutely critical here. Right. We, you can't compare you know, apples and, and, and oranges. You have to p compare data, the, the, the data for cross-platform viewership. You know, for example, the debate here about the NFL, NFL viewership, is down. The, the National Football League here, the, the American Football League, is down. Why is that? Well, there's probably a little bit too much of it, to be fair. <laughs> there have been issues like the San Francisco quarterback raising issues about loyalty, American loyalty, or loyalty to the flag and the, the, the anthem. Uh, probably, the data understates the audience because they're using different devices. And what we're seeing, in part, it's not the whole explanation, in part, we're seeing that the statistics reflect that. We have to get the measurement devices right because my view at the, at the end of the day is new media will continue to develop. Digital is 40% of our business. The worldwide rate weighting is about 28%. We're over-indexed, but we're not over-indexed enough because the market is moving more and more that way. So it's going to keep on going that way, but we have to, to get the balance right, we have to have better data. Right. Uh, so, so that, and then the, the other thing is this, I think, Jason, that, that if you look at our stats, Google is still three to one to Facebook. Last year, it was four to one. That tells you something about the power of search and the importance of search. And then the increasing importance of programmatic, even the potential increasing importance of dynamic creative DCOs, as they're concerned, that they're called, which algorithmically uh, place creative work suited to the target. So I'm married. Uh, my wife has just had a baby. I'm interested, goodness knows what reason, in cricket. <laughs> and I like to ski and whatever it is. So the creative that I would receive through programmatic would reflect what you know demographically about me and my family, 
and what I may or may not be interested in. So, putting all that together, I think the march of digital will continue, but, but we have to get the balance right between digital and traditional, and I think there's an imbalance at the moment. As always, you know, stock markets swing too far one way and the other. I think fads in media uh, and trends in media swing too far one way or the other. And we've got to examine engagement data. We've got to examine the basic viewing data. And I'll give you one other, another example. We have Twitter data for the UK and Spain, which clearly shows that live television is more powerful and more engaging, and this is through social media, through data from social media, is more powerful and more engaging than we think it is. Right. That people are multitasking when they're watching live TV, you know, Britain's Got Talent, The Voice, or whatever it happens to be. So, so we just have to get the metrics right, because at the moment, I think we're making decisions which may be ill-advised. And so, in this room and at this conference, there's lots of, of, of maybe smaller startups, very techy. It sounds to me then that, 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 that you would, if you were to give them ad advice on their branding, messaging, advertising strategy, it's not to totally give up on non-digital platforms, that there's still value in the, in the traditional media, as you, as you called it. Is, well, that, I, is I, that correct? I think, I, I, yes, but I mean, you've just got to look at Google, the market leader. I, I, you ought to ask them how much they spend on traditional media. I think. I think the figure is something like two and a half billion. Their total media budget is two and a half billion. A lot of that goes on traditional media. So, so and, and in fact, if you look at, as they try to extend their influence with publishers, one of their bargaining chips is their investment in traditional media. Hmm. So, so uh, the answer is no, you, you, you must. I mean, you've only got to watch television, look at billboards, listen to the radio, look at all forms of media to see that the, the new media are probably even more avid users of traditional media uh, than, than so-called new media. So the, the startups that we're talking to at Unbound you know, it, uh, have got to focus on those old media or traditional just as much as we used to. Right. So a, a few minutes left here. I want to, to, to do some, some, some very forward-looking uh, stuff from, from you. You've, you've been in the industry for a while. And I'm kind of curious, you were mentioning you know, the WYSI um, algorithms and all this kind of thing. 50 years from now, what will the ad industry look like? Will it be a Sir Martin Sorrell type at the top and then a, just a bunch of uh, AI bots below it sort of targeting our, well, our, our every secret desire? Well, I, I, got, I, I won't be around, so, <laughs> so that will not be... That will be not we can upload like you into the cloud, perhaps, yeah. Either from up there or down here, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll be wrestling with it. Um, the honest answer is I don't know. <laughs> if, I, if, I look at, if I look at our business, uh, the, the three themes that we're very focused on in, in terms of there are four things that we look at. One is called horizontality, which is getting everybody to play together. So one, one brand, long term, if you're talking about 50 years, if WPP, I think, will be one company uh, in 50 years' time. Yeah. What, what Eric, for example, has done this year with Kantar to create one Kantar, which is 25% of our business. It's $5 billion of revenues out of... 20 billion. Uh, what he's done or is in the process of doing with one Cantor is what in 50 years we will have done uh, with, the, with the whole of WPP. So that's one thing. The second area is fast growth markets, which are a third of our business. The next billion consumers over the next 10, 15, 25, 50 years is not going to come from the US and Western Europe. It's going to come from Asia, from Latin America, from Africa, the Middle East, and Central and Eastern Europe. Digital is currently 40% of our business, close to. Uh, in, in 50 years' time, everything will be digital. So digital, digital will have permeated every area of our... And, and it's not going to be... Uh, it's going to be more about voice 
mm -hmm. rather than hands, uh, and it's going to be more about eyes. So that's it's going to be data, and, and there's going to be more and more important in our lives. It's 25 percent now. It will be more important in, in in our lives. And then lastly, content. Um, it's it's really critical. So the sort of things that we've done with Vice. The sort of things that we've done with Media Rights Capital, which brought you House of Cards. The sort of things we're doing with Full Screen, uh, with 100 YouTube channels, with AT&T and Peter Chernin. The sort of things that <coughs> we, did, we did with AT&T and, and Dish a week ago, where we bid for NVIDIA in addressable TV. All these things, I, I would say one company, uh, digital, <coughs> permeating everything, data critically important, and then this, this subset, subset of technology, data, and content melded together will be absolutely critical. It, it is highly likely, you know, we've seen things going on even this week. You know, we've seen Accenture pay, what was it, 50 million pounds for a company with 25 million pounds of revenue and 1.3 billion uh, million pounds of EBITDA. So we've seen it in the creative. So, so for 50 million pounds, according to campaign this morning, Accenture has changed its creative image. So you, you know you've got it in, in one. 50 million pounds buys you a new creative reputation. <laughs> we'll see whether that's that happens in the longer term, but clearly that sort of thing signals what we've been saying, that mad men or mad women and mass men and mass women, that the difference is getting broken down, they're, they're becoming more and more important to one another, and CMOs and CIOs are going to fuse their budgets increasingly over time, and the the the, 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 the left brain and the right brain are going to become one brain. So if that, that is all going to be whittled away. Right. Excellent. We got into neuroscience at the end there. We're over time. Thank you very much, uh, Sir, Sir, Sir Martin, for joining us and doing the sweep of the advertising industry. Thank you very much for, Thank for joining us.